Hey, this is Tiger. Welcome to my stream. Again, I did not manage to capture the intro, but this is not the worst thing that can happen. More important, please note that we are talking about playing a computer game, not handling real trains or railway stuff. So please leave this stuff alone. It is dangerous for you and everybody else involved and at least extremely annoying. Hey AJ, thank you for moderating my stream once more tonight. And um, since it is so hot that you can almost stand it, we are going underground to the London Underground Bakerloo line tonight. But we are not running the 1972 stock that is typically connected with the London Underground Bakerloo line uh, as it came with Trains in World 2, but we are doing the nice 1938 Heritage train that was uh, released by Rivet Games last year. And that is one of the DLCs that maybe did not get uh, the credit that it actually in my opinion merits hey zd radar nice to have you on the stream and mind the gap mind the gap always mind the gap and other things so the 1938 tube stock is a train that actually ran on that line for endless years since it was uh, built obviously in the 1938 years and years around no way you are going underground yes i am going underground tonight at least at least halfway the first part we will be actually running overground then we will go underground and stay there and uh well I, I i have not played the underground trains in a while and i have to say if you want to play it without the hut you have to really know your track and and your route because there is no way that you can react to any signs or whatever so you have to more or less run it blind and uh, rely on your new route knowledge and then whoosh, there will be a sign just lighting up for a split second and then you know ah you're there hum is it like driving uh, metro trains in the real world I guess you have to rely a lot on your root knowledge in, in, in Prague as, as, as well now. At least um, if you were in a situation to drive an old train without all the, well, um, electronic timetable things and stuff. Like on the 1938 tube stop. Uh, who did not get this train as a DLC for the Bakerloo line um, route might know this train from the Isle of Wight actually because um, those trains when they were thrown out from the Bakerloo line 10 or something of them were actually refurbished cut down a bit made significantly shorter and then transported to the Isle of Wight where they uh, ended their life as the British Railway class 483 that we know from the nice rivet DLC of the Isle of Wight, the old version. The new version again has um, outdated tube trains, the D trains, the D78 stock um, that then runs since I think two or three years ago. Um, as British Rail Class 484 on the Isle of Wight. So what do we what do we get from Rivet for the 938 tube stock? <clears throat> we get actually two trains and a full timetable with those trains. And and this is uh, it is not just that you get one train with two liveries and uh, they layer on the existing timetable. No, it is a full timetable made up with those two trains and. Uh, Picking those trains actually gives you different services because uh, the older version is the one with the red roof, the newer version is the one with the black roof, and uh, they use them together in this timetable. So if you look in this timetable, for example, that is the one that I played a bit, you find different services um, compared to the time 
table that you get if you look at the one with the black roof that I did not play, as you can see, uh, in preparation for this stream here. So, which one did I want to play tonight? A full run, north to south, Harrow and Wheelstone to Elephant and Castle, starting at half past five in the morning. And as we do that, uh, usually just uh, go into the service and have a look around at the train at everything around us and uh, then restart it again so that we are not too late and we have some time to look at our train so yeah we are at harrow and wheelstone with a seven car train as you can see 127.5 tons and we're supposed to go all the way to elephant and castle at 536 for some reason it is dark now. I did not want it to be dark, but anyway it is dark now. Maybe I did not Aha, the route map does not so show the other stuff. Maybe I picked a different month. I actually wanted to run it in uh, July, but maybe this got spoofed a bit. So here we're sitting on the so-called center siding at Harrow and Wheelstone, what is typically used more or less as a shunting uh, neck. Trains coming in here from the city, stop here at the station and then they can go to this shunting neck and uh, go back across the switch on the other line and go back towards the city. So here is not a depot um, where we can store the trains overnight. There are actually three depots on this route and they are all used uh, by the timetable. What is a nice thing? We will talk about that when we actually get there, I think. So, since it is night, we have actually every reason to use our cab lights. We have cab lights here, actually. Well, we have instrument lights and we have headlights. Those I know where the cap lights ended ended up. I don't know, maybe just turn on the bulb here. And then we can look around a bit in our cap. So it was actually nicely modeled. Obviously started with the with the British Rail Class 483 stock. And uh, well then installed the old stuff that we can see here. What we need to do to get this train running is not that much. I already turned on the headlights and the instrument lights here with this instrument here. Then the master key needs to be inserted and switched to on. Then we can use the reverser, put in the reverser key and there are two settings for forward. Whereas in the manual they tell you you should always use the forward one um, and the forward two is a setting that gives you a bit of extra power well honestly if you want to keep to the timetable you should use the forward two and uh, on the release stream i saw that matt who was running the train in the release team also used forward two i think forward one is more or less for um, applying less power if the rails do not have the adhesion that they usually should have so if you're running on snow and ice or um, wet leaves then you can switch it to forward one and then you're significantly slower reverse also works if you want to reverse but typically you don't have to reverse because you have shunting next to get about this is the brake system and release that brakes and then you have ep brakes electro pneumatic brakes meaning we are actually sending down electrical impulses the tr uh, down the train and then according to those electric impulses the brake cylinders will apply air pressure in the cars so this is actually and i think it was not originally in this train when it was built in 38 but something that was built into the mus and emus after world war ii at least and then i think this train got its ep brake 
setup. You have four settings for the brakes, hold, minimum, normal and max. And then if you go on, you find Westinghouse hold, Westinghouse charge and emergency. Emergency is the only thing where here actually the, the, the gouge underneath the brake system does anything. You release it. Westinghouse hold. Yeah, Westinghouse means it is an air brake. An air brake that works with a brake pipe, pressurized air to keep the brakes away and if you empty the air brake pipe then the brakes will apply. But this is in the train. I think it was the original brake system that was used on the train. But it is now since we have the EP brakes, the electro-pneumatic brakes, it is a backup system in case the EP brake system fails. For you as a driver or for me as a driver of the train, you need to be aware that if you just notch this brake up, EP min, uh, EP normal, EP max, you get more and more brake power. And then if you go on and go into Westinghouse hold, all of a sudden you lose your braking power because this is a manually lapping brake system here and uh, you would have to give it to charge to actually allow some air out of the air brake and then put it back into hold and if you want to apply more charge and hold charge and hold unless you go to emergency then you drain obviously the air brake pipe completely and then you perform a brake uh, application with this but typically as long as everything works out, you don't need the Westinghouse settings here at all, but you would just use the EP brake settings for everything. A dead man's handle, so this needs always to be um, pushed down, otherwise the train will perform a stop because then it thinks the driver is incapacitated. So this is actually our our vigilance pedal that we have in modern trains. It is more cumbersome because the driver always has to push it down. This is the camshaft, I think it is, and we have off the off. Let's put the reverser to off first. Um, we have the off setting, we have the shunting setting, we have the full series setting and the full parallel setting. This is always what we can do with our master controller. And in the presentation part today, I think we will have a look at how this actually works on the electronic traction equipment of what it does and what does it means if it says shunting and full serial and full parallel. And that is more or less the train. This thing here, this big weird thing used to be the old speed clock that has been replaced by the newer one for driving without the hut. Placing the speed clock up in this corner always gives you a bit of a weird camera angle because you, if you want to see your speed clock then you have to place the window that you can look out a bit in the bottom right corner, but it works. I don't know which of those indicators actually was meant to tell you something about the traction status but it does not work in the game actually, at least not um, from what I have seen. We have a weak field flag that can actually be used. What it has to do with field weakening and field uh, weak, <laughs> weak field, I think we will talk about in a different stream. Um, maybe on the British Rail class 313 that has a position on the camshaft that is called the weak field to get more power. So let's see if we can turn on the lights here. Somewhere on the, yeah, here, passenger lights off, passenger lights on. It's the old rivet, uh, placement of the buttons where you have to be dead center with your mouse in the button otherwise you won't hit it. So that it is. It is actually a nice train model. I really like it. It might look sometimes a bit um, not so calm with this wooden floor but I think Rivet did a great job with this train and uh, with providing it for this line here. 
Let's look at it with the outside camera a bit. Now that we've turned on the lights, we have three lights. We have this box here where we can um, set our destination by going to Elephant and Castle. For some reason, if we put in Elephant and Castle, then we will get a reading of Bakerloo Line Elephant Special. Special, obviously, because we are running the heritage trains, I guess. Why they did not put it elephant and castle special, I don't know. Now we have a special elephant running here. Sitting in the A end, we will see what that means later on in the presentation. And you can see that we have actually a seven car train. It, at some point, I think it was connected. No, what it is. I, at least I have seen trains that were connected of a three tra car train and a four car train but this one now oh yeah you can see it here is a cap and here is a cap so it's actually a four car train and a three car train put together how those different cars were set up we will talk about this later in the presentation i guess why do we have that many tracks here by the way what we see here is not only london underground tracks um to be fair, only the tracks with the four rails, third rail, fourth rail, um, belong to the London Underground. The tracks with the overhead uh, catenary electrification is actually a part of the West Coast main line that comes from a London Euston station, from where we are looking at at the moment, and runs more or less towards Birmingham, where we have been playing last week with the Birmingham Cross City Line and further on until they finally get to the West Coast at uh, Liverpool and, and then uh, go through Carlisle, I think, and end up in Glasgow. Um, so this is a very important line, actually, and we are running parallel to it and sharing this overground party with the London Overground uh, Line. So, CD Radar, what did you say? Fun fact, I originally started playing Train Sim World 2 because of London Underground, but I did not enjoy the darkness in the tunnels, so I started playing German routes and then I totally fell for them and learned PCB LCB and now I play everything but underground. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah, well, for me it was the second line that I played. The first thing that I played in Train Sim World 3 it is I, I've, I've said this a couple of times, always was Sandpatch Great, and this really got me into it, this this feeling of running those heavy trains in, in, in this coldish mountain atmosphere. That was that was nice for me. And then the second one was Bakerloo line that I played and that was totally different. And at the time I was still playing with the HUD and uh, I was already trying to figure out how you can read the speed clock and uh, react to what is happening in the real world and not only to what the HUD is telling you. And I found this quite difficult. Well, now I actually tried to memorize uh, all the speed changes and, and stations for this trip here, at least. So, July. Queen's Park to Elephant and Castle. No, I wanted this one. Harrow and Wheelstone, 5.30 at July and clear. Let's see if we get night again, then we try with it at night. But I thought actually last time I looked into it in July it was it was day and I think it is day here. Yeah. So what do we do? Master key, master key lever on, reverse it to forward to two, lights, brake release, signal is the position. Um, a light signal that allows us to pass. We are limited to a limit of 10 here. To go into the station. While we're running in the station, again we can set our, our box. Make sure that we don't go too fast, approaching a red signal anyway, and unlike Queen's Park we actually have to stay below the 10 miles.
Oh, hello, uh, Pocket Snickers. Thank you very much. I appreciate very much that you joined here and also on YouTube, presumably. Yeah, and I'm happy that, that you like the videos. So, typically we would have a guard on the train to operate the door controls. I thought about maybe running backwards all the time to open and close the doors, but I thought, well, no, let's not do that. Let's just focus on the driving here and open the doors with the keyboard shorts. So, we're starting off at Harrow and Wheelstone, line speed 45 miles. This holds true until we get to Wembley. And we can see the beautiful area in North London area. Again, here to the left is part of the West Coast Main Line. And we are running on our underground and overground tracks next to it. You can totally see the different electrification overhead catenary on the left and uh, fourth rail electrification for us. And CD Radar says, also I like to play with big trains, not a subway, when I literally meet it every day. That is something that I totally get. <laughs> if you drive subway trains for a living every day, then you might want to do something else. <clears throat> so, let's, say, let's see that I don't mess up the the stop here in Canton. And then I can read the chat again. Sweet for stop, uh, sweet spot for stopping is a bit beyond the two yards more like the three yards actually I have to go back and screenshot your signal aspect charts for the US railway because they are very nice thank you very much I'm happy that you find them helpful US signaling can be so confusing but it has a very charming logic to it at least sometimes or it has a couple of charming logics to it <laughs> next up is South Kenton Again, full line speed, 45 miles. One thing that you need to know about the camshaft controller here, if you are at full parallel, what is the highest setting, and want to slow down and uh, apply less power, you have to put it all the way back to zero or off. Otherwise, the train will just go on in full parallel.
this is a stop that always pulls the train more than you would think South Kenton here. I actually have no idea what happens there in real life. We're actually a bit ahead of time. Yeah, Sandpatch, great. You're writing in the chat that you are made your own signal chart for Sandpatch Grade. Sandpatch Grade is a bit of a mixture of different systems, so this is, I think, why I have not done it yet. And at the other end, you only get a very limited number of aspects in Sandpatch Grade. But eventually, I think I will get to it. Seaboard signaling mostly. We are approaching Wembley now. North Wembley to be exact. And what you can see here in the background, obviously, when we're going to Wembley, is Wembley Stadium. The biggest stadium in the United Kingdom. And as far as I know, the second biggest stadium in the world. Or in Europe? I forgot. I don't know. I'm not good with superlatives. At least it's a very big stadium. Talking about signaling, as long as we are above ground, we more or less have the signaling that we would expect on most British routes. Although it is a three aspect, not a four aspect signaling, so we don't have a double yellow, for example. Oh, I did not put up the service thing. Thank you very much. And not the DLC thing. Now we've got it. Thank you, AJ, for the reminder. And I need to go back in my game so that it accepts the lock door thing. Wembley Central is the next stop. Yeah, probably. You're right. I was just thinking, what is the, what stadiums are there that are bigger? And in the U.S., there are many, many stadiums that are probably as big as Europe. And there is a huge stadium in, or at least a couple of huge stadiums in Brazil. So probably Europe. Let's stick with that. Never challenge the US with something that is big because they always are bigger. What well, is totally okay. This is Wembley Central. So if you want to go to Wembley Stadium, this is one of the stations that you can use to get there. Approaching a red light at the end of the platform. See the radar says I cannot mention the brakes Strauss Stadium. 
it is very big <laughs> okay now maybe I should travel to Prague soon but first let's focus on the line here next up is Stonebridge Park that means we are going on the other side of the West Coast Main Line and for that going through an underpass that is why we're approaching a limit to 40 here while a train is coming from the opposite direction from here EP hold is typically enough to hold the train on the descent and prevent it from accelerating and as soon as we are down and passing under we can release the brakes and already prepare for running uphill on the other end because here 45 is allowed we have to pass this sign with the whole train before we can accelerate it. So, to the left you can see the rails that come from or take you to Stonebrick, uh, Stonebridge Park Depot where most of the trains that we are using here are stabled overnight. And you can play a couple of services where you bring the trains into service from this depot. That's a, a fact that I really like about this timetable, that trains are starting in the depot, go all day back and forth the line, and then end up being stabled in the depot again. Not leaving the map through portals, not just vanishing into thin air. Here again you can see Wembley Stadium and the busy mm, motorway here. I did not look up the number. That guy really wants the seat behind you. Yeah, for some reason that is a very, very popular seat. It is almost always occupied. This here is uh, the Princess Royal Distribution Center, if I'm not mistaken. Obviously not for distributing Her Royal Highness Prince Anne, but distributing mail and parcels. Now we're approaching Harleston. The yellow aspects typically do not hurt us because we know that the signal, the next signal is the one at the end of the station and we have to stop there anyway. So, let's use a bit more brake, of course, since I was a bit late. So you might have seen that typically it is enough for a stop to use EP hold and EP minimum, but if you're a bit late on the brakes you can always use the settings above with 
the cavi caveat about the Westinghouse settings, obviously. That is a bit weird. If you happen to go beyond the EP max, you end up with no brakes at all. And we're back on our time. Now we are passing under a different line that is coming in to the west coast main line from the left. This is why we will have to prepare for getting slowed down to 30 as soon as we are up on the other end again. So from what I've seen, it's typically quite okay to accelerate until you are under the bridge, then use the climb to slow down and then here is a certain spot where I use the EP hold setting and that should slow me down enough for the 30 so that I can just release it and be on the 30. Hold, minimum. It's a bit... It's one of those stops here where you always run a bit further than you would expect, so let's take it easy to not run the red signal. And I ran one click too fast. Just as announced. Signals typically only switch after you have reached the destination time. Still in the 30 limit. But it will climb back to 45 before we get to cancel green. So for the accelerating, if starting the train, obviously the shunting setting at about 4 or 5 miles per hour to full series and at about 10 or 12 miles per hour full parallel. From what I have seen, this is what accelerates the train best. And then when you are almost at your target speed, back to off and then, if necessary, back to shunting to add a bit more traction. At this signal that we are just approaching, we get back to 45 as soon as the whole train has passed the sign. We will see later, underground, we can accelerate as soon as the tip of the train has passed the sign with a higher speed limit. Since we are over ground, we have to adhere to the old rule that we cannot accelerate before the whole train has passed. Cancel Green Station is just behind the tunnel exit train from the opposite direction is coming in, gives us the opportunity to cherish the train. It is a one of, with a black roof. Oh, and cherish too much so that I ran it again. Ah, it's still good. Here you can see the difference in the two trains. 
The one has a black roof, that is the newer train, and the red one is the older train. The difference is, for example, that the black roofed one has an antenna on the... Here you can see it. An antenna. Ah, we can actually... Did I close my doors already? No. Close the doors. Queen's Park. Queen's Park is the last station overground and from Queen's Park on we will go underground and in between I wanted to switch my presentation for today. Limit is 45 here but we will have to slow down to 15 because as a, a real oddity we will pass through the little depot north of Queen's Park station in service but you usually never do taking your passengers into the depot unless it happens accidentally actually happened to me the other day that I um, was so involved in reading up stuff for the stream that I failed to leave the subway train at the last station and all of a sudden I was in the depot and I knocked at the driver's compartment and asked whether when we are going back and luckily enough it was just a shunting neck so I was back on track after a couple of minutes. <laughs> yes, and here the passengers can have the depot tr uh, tour as a treat. You can see it on the right, there is the depot that is used as a shunting neck as well. There's one train, well this is the train going into the other direction towards Harrow and Wheelstone. And the middle two tracks are used for stabling the trains and for a shunting neck and the outer two lanes during service times are actually used for driving through with the passengers on your train so that is really rare what city I, I will I will tell you later city radar not on stream So, stop at Queen's Park, the last overground stop, and that is the time for the presentation. So where did my OBS vanish to? I wanted actually to start with a presentation about where in Great Britain actually the routes are that are in trains in world because I was talking about that the subway trains were transported from London to the Isle of Wight and I wondered is that actually quite a distance and how did they get there and it is not so big a distance after all and this um, gave me the idea that I should try to mark all the routes that we have in trains in world 3 on a map of well most of the British Isles. You can see it is mostly England and Wales, a bit of France here in, in the corner and Scotland, not the northern part of Scotland. Please give me a route in the northern part of Scotland and I will e uh, uh, extend this, this thing. Also here a little bit of Northern Ireland you can see and the Isle of Man we don't have anything here. So what do we have? We have the Bakerloo line. It is running from the north west into London through the West End and then just cutting under the River Thames and ending in uh, Elephant and Castle. This is what we will doing and now let's see how the other stuff connects to it. We have the Great Western Express that is, this is most more or less the, the thing from um, towards Reading 
goes on to 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 Bristol, but it is not in the game actually. Then we have the South Eastern High Speed with the Javelin, especially going towards the Channel Tunnel, and you can see why the Channel Tunnel is here because France is very close at this point. And uh, we have the Brighton Main Line, that is the super 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 big DLC London computer where we can run from London, uh, London Victoria Station to Brighton. Then we have the a bit older East Coastway from Brighton to Eastbourne and um, to the ferry here, this little bit. And here actually is the island line. This is the Isle of Wight. So they took the trains from here, where is London, and took them here to the island line where you can go from St. Uh, what is it called again? San John Wright to Wright Pier to Shanklin on the other end. And you can see this really a small route, a little, little route. Birmingham is here with the Cross City Line where we have been playing two weeks ago. Then uh, the Midland Main Line is approximately here. Nottingham at one terminus. I don't own this route yet, but I eventually will. The great, great DLC Northern Transpennine from Manchester to Leeds is more or less here. The Glossop line connects at a different station in Manchester and runs about this way here. The Spirit of Steam route, Liverpool to Crewe, is about this here. At the, we've talked about the West Coast Main Line from London, Birmingham, Liverpool, Manchester, and then Carlisle is about here, and then it goes up here too. Glasgow, the mountain peak line, by the way, is about here, I think. Then we have played the very, very impressive Tees Valley line. You can see how far north that is in uh, Yorkshire. And uh, then even further up north, we have the Edinburgh, what is more or less here, and the Glasgow, what is on the left side, uh, Express DLC, what I don't, do not own yet. South of Glasgow, we have the Cathcart Circle Line, what I own, but I have not played it on stream yet. What still do we have? We have the West Somerset Railway, that is the Heritage Railway that we have been played with, the Western Tiger, the Class 52. Um, what is a, a gem? I still think it is a gem, even if a lot of people think that it is super boring because the uh, speed limit is so low. It is set here in West Somerset, obviously. And then we have the East Combo Local, where we have been playing to discuss the uh, hydrodynamic DMU um, transmission thingies, also a rivet route. This is... Uh, according to my counting, what we have so far in this universe. So if anyone connected with DTG is watching, where is Wales? There is no route that is in Wales. Please have some Wales, some Welsh route also. And we can use more Scottish routes and obviously maybe a route in Northern Ireland. This is missing as well. Yeah, that's that presentation. The other presentation is more train related again. So if I'm boring you with this uh, presentation like we did before, uh, then just let me know in the comments and I do that for myself. But I always like to know where things are and how they connect. And uh, so I thought it was time to put the donor map. If you want to see that for German or American routes, then please also tell me, then I will fix something together of that kind. Yeah, but our topic today actually is bridge, bridge transition traction control. How do we control our train? How do we get the electricity um, through our train and convert it into turning wheels and a moving train? And this with the technology that we had in 1939 or 38 what is almost 100 years ago um this is our rail this is our coach our car and obviously you have seen that our car sits on bogies two axles per bogey and this is more or less our driving car electric traction at the time was most of the time DC traction. 
direct current, not alternating current AC, but DC. At um, present, almost all electric um, traction vehicles use AC traction, but at the time, DC traction, for a couple of reasons, was the thing that you would go to because it was easier to handle and easier to control than AC. And this is why the oldish lines like the uh, London Bakerloo Underground Line, what is um, far older than 100 years, I think it started service in 1905 to 1915 or something like that, has DC traction and obviously DC traction motors then in their bogies. So we have one of those traction motors per bogie. I'm not entirely sure whether it is on the first or the second axle on the A or the D side. We will see it is reversed, but I just, um, for reasons of uh, convenience, put them on the rear axle on this end that we are discussing here. So we have DC traction motors. What is a DC traction motor? You feed DC traction, direct current, into the motor and then it rotates a shaft. And this more or less is connected with the axle, with a quill drive, for example, that sits on the axle and turns the axle around. And so we can convert electric current into a turning wheel and propel the train. Um, how do we get the electricity there? This is why I, uh, I drew the line, if you look, on it from the top to demonstrate that we do not only have a third rail here like it is common on other uh, networks but on the London Underground we also have a fourth rail. So the third rail is, and this is quite common, used for getting the electricity into the vehicle and it is picked up by a shoe that is typically fixed to the bogey and with that it just um, yeah, more or less rides on, 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 the, on the third rail and gets an electrical connection and here the energy can get into the train. And it is wired through one traction motor, through the second traction motor and then typically on normal three rail, third rail installation, you would uh, use the rail that you are driving on as a return, an electrical return, so that the circuit can be closed back to the plant where you put in the energy but for various reasons this did not really work in the london underground because in london you have a lot of stuff in the underground under the earth that can conduct a current and is not insulated and not uh, connected to whatever so that you have a lot of stray current or had a lot of stray current running through mains and pipings and the the steel that was used to um to 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 uh, to, to put them on on the tunnel walls and that stuff and uh, so, so this did not really work out you lost a lot of energy and uh, had arcing and sparking issues and stuff and so they built the fourth rail between the two rails that you are riding on to close the circuit and then you had a brush underneath your uh, train <clears throat> that connected with the fourth rail and so the circuit is closed from the plant it goes along the third rail picked up by the shoe in the train at this stage here through both traction motors and then back in the fourth rail this is where the current can flow and while the current flows through the traction motors they turn the wheels that is the principle here. The third rail would have a voltage of plus 420. The fourth rail would be uh, set to a negative voltage of 210 with direct current. You can actually set that to a constant value. And then between the fourth and the third rail, you have a voltage put together of 630 volts DC that you can use for your traction motors. And that is what the traction motors can take maximum. <clears throat> the problem is though, we have talked about it uh, in a different stream about um, transitioning, that if your train is sitting in the station, you cannot just flip a switch and put 360 volts DC on the traction motor while the train is sitting in the station. You need a lot of torque though, but you cannot put 
throw the whole line voltage on your traction motors, otherwise um, something will break. The traction motor will fry or the, the cogs on, and gearings will break or anything will, will break. So you have to put it on step by step. You have to increase the voltage shift that you throw on your traction motors uh, um, gradually. And how do, the do, how do you do that? In modern days, we have a, a lot of, of gimmicks to do that with, with AC traction motors like variable frequency drives and, and GTO thyristors or IGBT um, transistors that, that use a, a lot of more or elaborate stuff. But think back, um, we are in 1938, so almost 100 years ago, and what can we do with our direct current here to gradually apply the current to the traction motor? We use Ohm's law and put resistors, resistances in the circuit on both ends before the traction motor. And what happens there? If we put a resistor in a, an in, in, in electric circuit, then Ohm's law, the current that runs through the circuit will be the voltage divided by the resistance. That is Ohm's law, as, at least as I always understand it. I, I will have to mention I am not a, a technical person. I just try to understand it with my normal brain and to share what I understood. But that it is. You put resistors, resistances in the circuit and then you get less current at, uh, at, at the same time. So you divide the line voltage that you get by the number of resistances that you put in. So this is a way to dampen the force that works on your traction motor. The current that actually flows, the amperage, is lower if you have resistance in it. Okay, and this is more or less the setup that you get when you put your camshaft into the shunting position. Then you apply um, a current to your traction motor. You close the switch but you have all the resistances in so this is the smallest um, uh, force that you can put on your traction motor and it is just enough to set the train moving as soon as the train is moving the traction motors can actually take more voltage and uh, provide more power to the wheels they are turning faster and faster and faster so even though you need we will discuss this later, less truck uh, torque to turn the wheels, you um, get, can, can put or throw more voltage on your traction motors up to a point when they can take the 360 volts that are in the, in the line. Um, but how do we do that? How, how can we throw the resistances out gradually? We wire them in a way that they can be shortcut with switches. At this point and at this point. So you can see we have little shortcuts around each resistance with a switch. And then step by step we close the first uh, switch here and we cut out the first resistance in front of each traction motor. We close the next one and we cut out one more resistance and Ohm's law um, the current is the voltage divided by the resistance if you cut out the resistances step by step, that number that you divide by gets smaller and smaller and this increases the current that can run in the traction motor. That is simplified, obviously, everything, but it helps me to uh, understand this principle. And we can go on until we get to the point where all the switches are closed, all the resistances are cut out, and this is what is called full series. And um, on even older trains, this switch closing and cutting out resistances was done by the driver. He would more or less cut out one resistance after the other. Um, in a more elaborate train that we have here, it is done automatically by a thing that is called a notching relay. And what we do with our camshaft, we put it to full series and allow the notching relay to go until this point. It measures um, the current in, in the traction motor and um, at some point it is obviously 
set to do that, it uh, closes the next switches and cuts out more resistances until it gets to the full series. And at this point, we have all the amperage that we can take on both uh, traction motors because every electron that is traveling through our line goes and passes through both traction motors. But since they are put in series, we only have half the voltage on either traction motor. That is a simple uh, truth about electric circuits. If you put two things in series after the other, then you divide the, uh, the voltage between the two. The amperage will still be the same for the whole circuit because the whole current passes through both things, but the voltage will be divided by two. And is that good or is that bad? Well, obviously, coming back to our old um, uh, 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 our old chorus to our thing, what does the amperage do and what does the voltage do in an electric traction motor? The amperage, the current, translates into torque, into the force that the motor is turning around the shaft. So it can be with more or less force to turn the shaft around one rotation. Whereas the voltage transfers to the speed that the motor is turning around rotations per minute. So if you want to increase the rotations per minute, then you have to increase the voltage. If you have, want to increase the force with which the motor is turning the shaft and the wheel, obviously, you have to increase the amperage. And so it is obvious that in the beginning, when we need to start our train, and we have talked about this a lot, when we want to start the train, we need a lot of torque because the first rotation is always the hardest. We all know that from riding a bike with uh, stuck gears. I've talked about this a couple of times. The first rotation is the hardest. You have to stand on the pedal with your whole weight and turn it around. And as soon as you get into motion, it gets easier, easier, easier. So you would use obviously a, a gear mechanism to, to counter that. But just imagine you don't have a gear mechanism, then you soon will get to the problem that you cannot increase the rotation speed anymore because you almost, you, you don't need any uh, force to turn it around once it almost turns around by itself but you want to increase it anymore so if you want to start the train we need a lot of torque and this is the point where we need a lot of amperage on both traction motors and this is why we start with series so that we get the full amperage that we can get at this point that the motors and the bogies can take and well content ourselves with only having half the voltage. But this is okay. When starting the train, they don't need to rotate that fast. But at a certain point, we're going faster and faster and faster. We don't need that much torque anymore to turn around the wheels, but we want to go faster. And going faster means we have to increase the number of times that the wheels are turning per minute, so the rotation per minute, and this is, we need more voltage on the traction motors. And how can we do that? Obviously, we have talked about it, if they are set into series, then we will divide the voltage by the two uh, uh, traction motors. So why not build um, a device so that we can no longer have them in series, but in parallel? For that, we built in two switches here in the connecting wire and we built shortcuts again. This is a shortcut that goes around the first set of resistances and the first traction motor. And this is a shortcut that goes around the second set of resistances and the second traction motor. And if we want to switch from series to parallel, we just have to move these switches here and connect no longer this line but the shortcuts and then the current divides at this point half of it goes around those uh, resistances into the first traction motor and then directly back into the return and the other part the other half of the current goes around the first traction motor directly to the second one and after that back into the return and this results into the current being halved because 
only every second electron that runs through the line goes through one traction motor. The other one going through the other traction motor. But since they are no longer set into series, the voltage will be full on both traction motors. And this allows us to increase the speed that the traction motors are running. And this one volt, what means all the volt that we can, all the voltage that we can get from the 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 third rail, uh, goes through each traction motors. And this is why they can take the 360. Uh, this is the point where they take the 360 volts DC. So, and this is why it is called full parallel because now everything is in parallel and all the resistances are out. Um, I have to admit that typically the train would probably not switch from full series directly to full parallel, but it would at this point switch to parallel and at the same time cut in uh, some resistances again and then go through the cycle of cutting out the resistances one by one until all of them are cut out and then you are at full parallel again. If we put our camshaft from full series to full parallel, then we allow the notching relay to finally end up at the position where the traction motors are set into um, parallel, not in series anymore, and all the resistances are cut out. So that is more or less what this bridge transitioning thing, as I understood it, as always, is working. Because we are bridging at this certain point here from um, we are bridging the current from not going through the or not fully going through the first set of resistances and traction motor but it goes across the bridge to directly go to the second one this is I think why it is called bridge transitioning and this you can find off uh, on a lot of um, trains of this era a simple quite easy to understand way to manage this. Another thing that we need to know about our train here, let's look at this. This is the cap that we are sitting in. We have four axles. Let's name them A, B, C and D. If we have a train that needs to run on a line back and forth and it's always good to have a driving cap on the other end as well. If we would just set, the, take the same um, the same uh, vehicle, turn it around by 180 degrees and couple it, then we would have the problem that we also reverse the alignment of our axles here. It would start at this side with A, B, C and D. <laughs> yeah. Um, and this obviously is a problem because if we now apply power, the train would rip itself apart because those bogies or traction motors would start propelling the train into this direction and the other one in the other direction. So this is not good. So what do we do? Obviously we have to turn around the car, otherwise the cab would not make any sense. But we change the alignment of our bogies. We have now the A here, the B here, the C and the D here. And then both bogey sets are aligned in the same way and if we apply um, our uh, our order to apply traction then both of them are going into the same direction and this is why this setup here is called the A end and the other one is called the D end so if you ever wondered where the B end and the C end uh, have uh, ended up they don't exist because those are the axles in the middle. So it's the A end and the D end. And you always have to couple the trains in, 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 in this setup. Otherwise, the train will always try to separate itself because the, the, the commands that you are sending from, from your camshaft go with an electric uh, system to every traction motor in the same way. And on our seven car train, we even have cars in the middle that do not have a cap, but they have traction motors that are um, non-driving motor vehicles, they are called. This is a driving motor type A, this is a driving motor type D, then there are non-driving motors, they have motors, but they don't have a cap. Then there are special non-driving motors, 
They are just like non-driving motors. They have motors, but not a cab. And they have door controls. And then there are trailers. And the trailers, they don't have any traction equipment. They just have the bogies. They just run in the middle. And they don't have a cab. And they don't have door controls. I think this is what I wanted to tell you about this train and the bridge transition control. I find that super fascinating what you can build with um if we look at it today so limited means uh yeah and cd radar says thank god for modern train computers just put level forward and it does everything yeah more or less 100 years ago you would have said yeah this is a new notching relays to everything for you you just have to put your camshaft into this position and it notches on its own Yeah, maybe maybe I uh, I will get to a point where I understand enough of um, AC motor control to to talk about GTO thyristors and what is it called insulated gate bipolar transistors. What is more or less the the latest stuff I, as I understand it that you use to um, power your variable frequency drive that more or less controls the frequency and the voltage that you have in your AC driving motors. But this is not something that is so easy to set out as the bridge transitioning. Well, thank you very much for bearing with me for this presentation. Um, and we can go back to train, train driving. We're st still sitting. AJ, you're leaving us now, I think, if you are still here. Thank you for moderating this. I have to... Oh, we actually have to go now. Now it is green. We're still in the 15 limit. Coming out. Well, thank you for moderating the stream so far and see you next time. Here's a little depot with a train in it too. And here's the first underground speed sign. You can see the square has a number on it. And the 35 applies as soon as we have passed it with the tip of our train. So we can actually accelerate down towards Kilburn Park. So, and now there starts the point where I have to memorize. 35 until we get to Kilburn Park. Moving around in the cab makes it even harder to read what your speed clock is telling you. The external cameras. Oh, no, I got confused and opened the door on the wrong side. The external com cameras are very limited here on the ground. We only have one number three camera. And it is always on the correct side. 35 to Maida Vale. I'm not exactly sure, by the way, where the, the light in our cab is coming from, because I did not turn on the cab lights. Now 
Now if you want to pay attention, there are cracks in the walls clipping in our cab here. Or is it later? Now it does not work. And I overbraked it a bit. It's a ghost in a second man's seat. Now here those cracks are clipping. Did you see? That is spooky, isn't it? I show the cameras when stopping, as I'm doing right now, but I'm afraid I can only show this camera perspective because the other cameras don't work on the ground. To Warwick Avenue we are at 30, then 35. And there is this track that gets some light. We are going to the right a bit. We have to slow down. And then going to the left and then... There should be the point where we can accelerate to 35. <clears throat> the camera at the full stop position. Ah! Now I know. The camera feed. Oh. So, here we have a major clipping issue with this sign here, and the cameras here, the camera feed at the full stop position. Here we actually have to get up, otherwise we don't see our exit signal. Paddington 35 to 25. So at first we can accelerate to 35. And at the next double aspect signal we have to slow down to 25. So we can coast a bit. Here is the double signal. And EP hold. And with a bit of luck, we should be at 25 as soon as we get to the 25 sign. We will only flick by about now yep it was well this is obviously not something that you can react to you need to know that it is coming yeah I stopped short because I actually stopped at the two yards mark And the stop markers or the sweet spots are not always where they are supposed to be. Let's see. But you see, the stops all were in the sweet spot. 500, 500, 500, 500.
least here we can see the exit signal. That is Paddington to Edgware Road. That means 20 now and then later 30. Let's see if we see the sign that allows us to accelerate to 35. I typically don't see it, but it should be here. Yeah, it was a T sign. I still have to figure out what that exactly means if the sign does not give you a specific speed, but a T. If that is a resume or terminate or whatever. Edgware Road. All right. So now I'm a bit slow, but we will get there eventually. Change for the circle line, yes. In Edgware Road. Or at Edgware Road. Again, I cannot see the signal. I have to get up to see the signal. And we are going to Malibon. I think is it is what you call this thing. The Y is not really pronounced. Malibon. It's 25 all the way to Malibon. According to my recollection. Oh, that is great. I saw a good video about a guy who runs the Bakerloo line in real life and played it in the game. That's an interesting thing. Oh, 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 oh. Malibone. Well, again, the question, CD Radar, if this guy runs it in real life, why would he want to play it in the game? But it is obviously something that you cannot get by just reading it up. Baker Street, that's again 25. So if you, if you could link this video for me, I would love to watch it. So did I overdo it with accelerating or was it just okay? Baker Street is 25. So I have the feeling that the train actually breaks harder outside of the tunnels and that you need more brake in the tunnels, but obviously this can also be a thing that is connected with gradient. 
Well, the track is more slippery underground. Baker Street, exit here for Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson. I have to get up, otherwise I don't see the signal. Did it switch? It switched. It starts with 25. It's going to Regent's Park. At some point there will be an increase to 30. Regent's Park is one of my favorite, or I think it's my favorite park in London. So here it was the sign that allows us to go 30. You just flick through. So you played Prague Metro Simulators. Okay. Well, I understand it. I guess you just want to know if they did a, a good job or not. Nice bend to the right. Uh, now I stopped short because I missed the break. That was five points, points, five points lost. London Zoo. Yeah. Again, we have to get up to see the signal. Unfortunately, this game does not have a key where you can lean out of your seat. Oxford Circus. That is 30 to 25 to 20. That is a bit of a difficult stop because we don't have a signal to go by. There is a signal in the distance and you have to judge because the reduction in speed limit is a bit before the signal. So about now I apply the brakes to get them down to 25 and here comes 2, 3, ping, here was the sign, yeah. And there is another signal again breaks to 20. 20 is at the next signal. About here on the right side it was. And then we have to apply some traction again because we're going uphill to Oxford Circus. Oxford Circus is the first of a 20 limit. Oxford Circus. Next is Piccadilly. Here we can see the signal. Oops, but we still have to wait for our departure time. We depart at 20, then it will increase to 30. But we are going steep downhill, you know. 
So careful, we will easily overshoot the 20. Thank you for posting the video. I will watch it later and compare my driving with someone who actually knows what they are doing. CD Rider says that is actually something I realized when I started driving metro trains how steep these inclines are. As passengers you don't feel it. Yeah. It is really crazy here. I think now we got to the point here is the increase to 30. So we can accelerate a bit but have to slow down again because 20 it is again here I think or shortly after. Not sure if I made it in time. I think I did. Here it was. Again 20. He drove the 72 stock. Yeah, I guess. The 72 stock obviously is the train that is still running in real life on the Bakerloo line. On the spot, time-wise. On the second, actually. Piccadilly Circus. Close the door, get up to see the signal. Signal switched. We can start. 25. But it will... only be on the 25 for a very short while. So, as soon as we get to the 25, we will have to slow down again. Because here, we are at the 20 again. So, to be fair, probably it does not make a lot of sense to accelerate to the 25 just to stop to the 20, but if you actually need to be that fast, and scrape every second out of the limits. Why not? Charing Cross. It's the station with this brownish uh, U at the walls. Oh. That was obviously the wrong key. So, next stop is Embankment. Straight 20. can see the signal, so no need to stand up. So Embankment obviously is the station just north of River Thames. Where the Houses of Parliament are and stuff.
same col color scheme as the 72 stock Again, we need to stand up, otherwise we don't see the signal. But it is green. And now to Waterloo, we are now running underneath the River Thames. Towards Waterloo. And I think we can go up to 35 and then slow down to 25 in approach to Waterloo. Between Embankment and Waterloo, this is the spot also where the connector to the London Road depot comes in. The other big depot next to Stone Bridge Park and that has CD Radar an incredibly steep tunnel that gets the train from the surface depot to the underground line In London Depot you can actually find point indicators. I have been looking for them in so many DLCs. And London Depot, uh, London Road Depot actually has it. Here we can go to 25, uh, 30 actually, to 30, if I am not mistaken, until we get to this combination of double green, single green, and at the single green we need to be down to 25 again. Here the switch, they were only visible for a split second. And then with 25 into Lambeth North. That's the one with the blue coloring. That is actually the second but last station here. Next one will already be Elephant and Castle. can just see the signal, <laughs> at least a tiny bit of it, but there is enough, so that we don't need to get up. Switched and go. Here's a short part where we can go 30 before we have to go down to 25 again, but this is, in my experience, not enough to accelerate to 30. Just skip it. Now here we can go to 30, but very soon after, we are back to 25, so I don't bother with that. Yeah, 25 again. Now at this point, always check if you're going to platform 3 or 4. If you're going to platform 4, 
you can relax and slow down to 20 after the third signal that you're passing or start slowing down to 20 is the third one if you are going to number three then you will changing sides already and that means that you have to slow down to 10 at this point where you usually would slow down to 20 because you're going across the switch yeah tunnel wall sometimes clipping in a bit well we have the easy solution and not going across the switch but stopping at elephant and castle 4 So, stopped exactly at 25 seconds, so we just made it in time. Open the door a bit later, so I'm three seconds late technically. Anyway, that was our service I guess. How did we do? I think I lost six points for stopping. One where I was short because I did not manage to release the brake and one for stopping a bit late on, where is it? It was the one, uh, Williston Junction, I think it was. Uh, anyway, don't worry. But the speed profile, I think it was more or less okay yeah so again um, if you want to stay in time use the forward two setting otherwise you don't have enough power to get your train there unless you get uh, bad uh, wheel slips or something don't use the forward one setting and uh, memorize the route that is the only thing that you can do without the hut i think because you cannot react to anything that is happening uh, sign wise the signs you can no, on, only know use if you know when they are supposed to appear as a marker where actually the speed changing point is but you cannot rely on reading the signs and acting to it there are some services where you actually have a signal action it uses um a bit like a four signal haupt signal a distant signal main signal system so a bit unlike what we know from the normal british system no i cannot use the external camera i have to stand up well the service starts again i would never have managed to change sides. Good thing that we're not playing it. Oh, but the AI is playing it. Well, then AI play it. Drive the train out of the station. Ah. On the red roof one, you have also have the London London transport livery, while the black roof one already has the London Underground logo on it on its livery. So maybe we just watch the train leave the station to conclude the stream. But they are not doing it. They think I'm driving the train. No, AI, I'm not driving this train home anymore. We will just go to Elephant and Castle and have a drink there, I guess. DD Radar, thank you for your input as always. Thank you, po Pocket Snickers, for your input as well. I will watch the video that you linked. And uh, maybe I tell you next time I see you on, on, on the chat or I thought about it. It was a nice evening. It was great with you. And I hope you enjoyed it a bit. Me running the Bakerloo line. Running underground. 
actually it is it is more th fun than I thought it would be. Thank you very much. Take care. Have a nice time.